This is the Page Publishing Book Club. How you doing? I'm your host, Alice Stockton Rossini, and way over yonder, how you doing, Rob Barrett's my engineer? So happy you're with us tonight. You know, it's no secret the publishing world has changed dramatically over the years. That's really an understatement. Unless you're like already known to someone in that world or you have really good friends there, it's almost impossible to get them to even open a manuscript, let alone read it. It's why page publishing exists and... You know, we've all heard the horror stories from authors who've tried and failed to get some attention from these larger publishing houses, which is why I found it really interesting when I talked to an established author who doesn't have a horror story at all. She's been published by the big guys, by a couple of big guys, and uh, she joins us tonight to explain how she ended up publishing her new book, with page publishing. It's called Love Letters in the Sand. Marsha Chellis, also known as Marsha Chellis K. Your first book was published with Simon & Schuster. Now, how did you end up with Page? Well, then I moved to Viking Penguin. You know, the, the business of publishing, as you know, has changed enormously since I started writing in um, 1985. And that was uh, New York Times, London Times, and Dublin Times bestseller. What was the name of it? The Joan Kennedy Story. That must have been great fun to write. Well, it was. It. it um, my background is in education, and um, because of this experience with Joan, um, I changed my focus from children. I, I had my own TV show on PBS in Boston and uh, taught for several years. And um, then moved back into the city and with my two kids and into the same building where Joan Kennedy was living. And um, Ted wasn't there. He just had her live there. We were both single women, and I was raising two kids. And she was on her own, and um, we became good friends. And we had both been interested in music and education and... uh, she needed a friend, and when Ted decided to run for the Democratic nomination in 1980, uh, she came to my door several times. She said, he's, he's going to run. I, I can't do it. Then she can come and say, he's not going to run. I'm so relieved. Went back and forth and back and forth. Then she came to the door, and she said, he's going to run. I need you to help me run my run this campaign. And so I gave up my job at PBS, and um, I had a secretary, a press secretary, Doris Kearns Goodwin, wrote Joan's speeches. Jeez. Oh, it was incredible. I would do it in a nanosecond. Again, even though it was 24-7. Oh, sure. I know. Yeah. I, I can only imagine. So that's why you were able to write this book, and you got the advance from Simon & Schuster and the whole bit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a huge six figures. And then you were able to write another book. I mean, I just think it's interesting, someone who has traveled the road you have, and you find yourself uh-huh. at a place like Page, that can be, I would think, comforting to authors that are going to Page to have them publish their books. How was your experience? It was excellent. I was very pleased. The difference between working with Simon & Schuster, for example, and Page, is uh, Simon & Schuster just took the manuscript, ran with it, made their own cover, wrote their own jacket blurb, and edited it any way they wanted. You know, (laughs) With Page, it was, what do you want on the cover? I said, well, I'd love to hear what your graphic designers think. No, we want to put on the cover what you want. So it was all back on my desk. I had to write the jacket for everything. But the result I'm thrilled with. And working with them was a very positive, very good experience. And I was very pleased with the result and uh, in the process. So you wrote Love Letters in the Sand. Um, it began with knowing a most unlikely couple. And in the book, she is a portrait painter living a very comfortable insular life on Boston's historic Beacon Hill. And then she meets this wanderer, someone who goes from one odd job to another. 
here and abroad. And he opens her eyes to the world, especially the Middle East, and she becomes a woman she never could have imagined. And so I set the story in Boston, because I was born there and very familiar with it, and Abu Dhabi, where I had traveled. And the response has been overwhelming. I'm absolutely thrilled with the responses I'm getting from women, but especially from men. And I normally, I write for women. And most of the early reviews on Amazon are from men. Interesting. So um, I would love to have somebody tell me, a man, (laughs) what it is that really captures men about this story. It's it's a woman's journey to self-fulfillment, you know. It's a woman who, like the opening quote, it's never too late to be what you might have been. And she becomes somebody entirely different because of this wanderer, very much unlike her her first husband. Um, the story begins while she is still married to a handsome, charismatic, though a difficult womanizer. And because she's a painter, a portrait painter, um, a short period of time follows after his death while she is trying to heal her memories. And she meets this wanderer. So the story goes from there, how their relationship develops. But this wanderer isn't what he appears to be. That's right. That's the perceptive view of you. He is someone who's concealing rage at where life has taken him. And um, and every once in a while, it appears, which makes it very difficult uh, for her uh, because he has a lot of good. She calls him her poet and warrior because he has a gentle, very talented side. And then he has these outbursts of anger. And that's probably from fighting in Vietnam on the ground. Sounds like a good one, Marsha. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good one. All right. And good advice, too. Um, by the way, Marsha is uh, going on a speaking tour, and she's going to be talking about something you might be interested in, how much fiction is autobiographical? That is the question, and it's a great topic for new authors. So she might be coming to your town. Check her out. When we caught up with our next author, Dawn Felton, she was watching Wendy Williams, and you are about to find out what that has to do with her book entitled Let Go of Your Heart. So we've got a little radio romance going on here, Dawn. Yes, yes, it is. It is. Uh, I just thought that the occupation for the main character would be exciting if he was a hip-hop DJ, so I thought that was exciting. I was born and raised in New York, in the Bronx, and I had the opportunity to move down to Tampa, Florida. So that was basically it. So if you start the story off, you read you read how the character's on the train in New York. It's like, oh, <laughs> I can't deal with this anymore. I'm happy now I'm going to be moving down to Florida. So that was me. I actually was watching a TV show, and I thought one of the actors was very intriguing, and I said, wow, I wonder... I wonder how he would be with a, a female in- love interest, like, w- with a black female. Like, how would he be? Like, how would he interact with her? And it just came from my imagination and my curiosity as to how an interracial relationship would would grow. Sounds like this guy was a womanizer, too. I mean... Yeah, he was. Yeah, you could say that he was. Um, Michael, he's Mikey Mike, the DJ from a hip-hop radio. So... I had to make him seem like he wasn't the best quality person to date. He was just kind of out there, always going around meeting ladies. And and I even use the term Mr. Smash and Dash. And so when he meets the female character, Cassie Williams, who is from New York, he realizes he can't do this saying, well, it's your fault I smashed and dashed with her. He's more... Oh yeah, yes, ma'am. Or yes, let me help you with the door. Or let me help you get your thing situated. And he realizes that he can't pull the same garbage that he would put on someone else. So the question is, can she tame him? That's a good point. Very good point. Can she tame him? And it, as I was writing it, it seemed like he just becomes more of a different personality with her than he is with other people. Okay. I have to ask you. You're from New York. Yes. When I called you, you were watching Wendy Williams who was a hip-hop DJ 
on a New York yes. City radio station. Yes. Did she inspire you in any way? Absolutely. <laughs> That's so funny. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I remember listening to Wendy Williams, like, back in the day, in the Bronx, listening to the radio. And, and, and at the time, because, you know, Wendy Williams was almost like a, well, almost a shock jock for our generation. I didn't like her. But as I started growing up and started, you know, realizing, you know, how the world works and realize, oh, wow, Wendy Williams is still out? Oh, wow, okay, great. And I think that's what kind of made me think, wow, maybe I can have him, have Michael Brentwood, Mikey Mike, uh, be a, a DJ. So that's that's what did it. It, it, was, it did influence me a lot. And I think it got to the point where I said, I know I'm going to publish this book, and I thought I was going to self-publish the book. However... Uh, one of my my husband's cousins wrote a book, and he published it through Page Publishing. And once I heard that, I got on the phone. I reached out. I was on the phone with him for like it must have been two hours. So as I got off the phone with him, I called Page Publishing, spoke to a representative. By the end of the conversation, I was emailing him my transcript, which was what I called was my baby. He put me at ease and sent me the confidentiality. Uh, agreement. So I felt more in control at that point of knowing that when I'm sending this email off, I'm not sending my baby off <laughs> to this vast land where we'll, we'll never be seen again. And I felt comfortable. And two weeks later, I sat off from Page Publishing. He called me back and said, we want to publish your book. And I couldn't believe it. I, I'm listening to him on the phone and, and I'm thinking, is this real? Is this real? Is this really happening? And there, there it was. That was about two years ago. And I like the process through page publishing because they never forced me to, let's get it done, let's hurry up. And I took my time with it. I wanted to make sure that whatever I put out was quality work or work that I felt comfortable putting out. Well, good, Don. You should feel comfortable. I mean, that's, that's one thing you really need to look for in a publisher. You don't want to feel intimidated or uncomfortable in any way. It'll just, it'll just block your whole creative process. Kelly Johnson writes about a cave off the coast of Norway and the mysteries it holds, particularly for three children. It's called Death's Door, Kelly. The story of Death's Door is about three characters. It's about Anakin, Britt, and Eva. It's based on their lives, and it's centered around a cave and how this cave affects their lives of all three characters. And it's about risk, and it's about real life and tragedy. The foundation of this book come from wanting to start my own company, and uh, I had an idea, and me and a team of writers, one of them was Alita Huff. Uh, she was co-authored it with me, and it was a group of people, and we put a lot of thought into it and a lot of rewrites, and it took us a, like a long time to get it finished. I, I'm reading your blurb. The story set along the southern coast of Norway. There's a cave there called Death's Door. There's a great monster of the sea, post-World War II. Actually, Death's Door is a cave off the coast of Nor Norwegian, Norwegian coastline. And the characters, they are children, and they actually grow up on the coast. And they know through their father the dangers of the cave, and they experience different things that goes on, uh, shipwrecks and different things. And everybody in Norway wants to conquer it. In other words, they want to see how close they can get to it. Some wants to end up finding out that they want to dive into it to see how deep they can go into its layers. And all through the book, you'll see as it, it has an effect on the people who lose their lives and how Anakin and Britt and Eva grow up. And there's also love, there's romance, and tragedy based on those three characters as they grow up together through their teenage years right on to they get adults. And the message to the reader is take risk. And life is going to give you things that you can't be prepared for, but take the risk and go ahead anyway. Well, it, it looks like you're about to take a risk yourself, aren't you? I'm trying to start my own company, which is called Fire Lamp, and we want to start writing books. This is our first one, and we're going. To, and we want the whole thing is to get a team of writers together to create more books and more novels and be able to sell them and create stories and ideas just like death's door and you got to have them all published by page <laughs> we, we could D did you have a good experience with page everything everything so far we've had a good experience with page publishing 
I treated this right. All right, Kelly. Good luck with your new endeavor. And with that, we have got to take a quick break. Coming up, a coming-of-age mystery, using creativity to make a better world, and how to buy a condo. Don't you go anywhere. This is the Page Publishing Book Club. Have you written a book and want to get it published? Then now's the time to call Page Publishing at 800-204-6099 and do it immediately. You see, they're looking for authors of all types of books. And unlike most publishers, Page Publishing will take the time to review most of the books submitted to them. And they'll even give you their feedback. And if they like what they read, Page Publishing will get your book into bookstores and for sale online at Amazon, the Apple iTunes Store, and other outlets. They'll handle everything. Copyright protection, printing, cover art, publicity, and editing. So if you've written a novel, a children's book, a cookbook, inspirational work, a book of poetry, or biography, and want to get it published, then you need to call Page Publishing and do it immediately. Call 800-204-6099 now for your free author submission kit. Your road to fame and fortune could very well start with this simple phone call. For your free author submission kit, call Page Publishing at 800-204-6099. Welcome back to the Page Publishing Book Club. I'm Alice Stockton Rossini. You knew that. The Silver Bottle Mystery is the first of four books in the Michigana, I hope I got that right, Michigana Mansion Mystery Series. And the idea came to Richard Kaufman back in the 70s when he was a second grade school teacher and his students became the inspiration for his characters. So tell me about these characters, Richard. Uh, there, there are four main characters, Ellen, Barbara, Billy and Marie, and they all range between 10 and 12 years old. Helen and Barbara live in Biggs, and uh, since Billy and Marie's mother is having an operation and will be incapacitated for six weeks, Billy and Marie have to live with the uh, Ellens up in Biggs. And the first day of summer vacation, all four of them are searching around uh, the attic in Ellen's house and Billy and Marie find an old, dusty photo album which contains a mysterious photograph that's been torn down the middle. Now, Marie knows exactly where the other half is, and they do eventually get the two halves put together, but it makes no more sense than it did before. Part of the message to mention something about silver bottles. After they get it together, it reads, Three silver bottles beneath four rocks will be for Will to take from a box. A step to the east to line up three trees to sap a football, if you please. And they put the message together, but they can't figure it out, what it means. Now, how is the message connected to the uh, mysterious house on Michigan Ridge? And that, that house hadn't been lived in for over nearly 30 years, but there are soft, barely perceptible screams heard coming from the house. And there are flashes of light and strange images coming from the attic dormer window. Somewhere along the way, they do connect the mysterious message and the house on the ridge. But uh, you will never discover what that connection is until you read Mystery of the Silver Bottle. And I'm telling you that it is distinctly Christian. I, I've, I've read this, I've been reading Mystery since I was 10 years old. And Every time I read a mystery and it's good halfway through and it's got stuff in it that's objectionable, uh, the language or else uh, situations arise, I close the book up and toss it out or give it back, whoever. I don't want to read it. I, I've come to the conclusion that C.S. Lewis said, a children's story that is only meant to be read by children is not a children's story in the least, which means that anyone can read these mysteries and feel it. I'm amazed that you're just coming out of the gate this is a series of books, four books. Well, I've been working on it for a long time, and life got in the way, and uh, I just couldn't uh, complete it. But it's done. And, oh, one more thing, too. The illustrations are done by the author, me. I did not want page publishing to touch my illustrations, so they're done by me. Good for you. We, we There's a lot of authors that do their own illustrations. So how are you getting this book to the kids that you want to read it? Libraries. I went to the bookstore. I went to... Uh, I passed out the uh, the press the press release that you people issued. I'm glad we could be of help there, Richard. You're on the right track. By the way, Richard says his books are so good, he gets excited reading them. And he knows what's going to happen. 
Our next author, Christopher Eddy, is in his second year of college at Louisiana State. Philosophy is his major with a focus on law, ethics, and social justice. He's an artist at heart, determined to make a difference, and begins with his book entitled Creativity Culture. So what do you mean exactly by creativity culture? Well, I really think that my motivation for the title is based on the idea that creativity can be rooted in anything like just the creation of ideas and solutions to problems should be what we as a culture should base our goals and energies off of. And so a lot of the poetry has to do with what I believe uh, like creativity should instill. So things like loving yourself and um, creating solutions towards large problems creating a culture that aims for striving to create solutions to issues that you have. Like what kinds of creativity? Well, see, that's what I think is so incredible about creativity is it's it ranges from all sorts of techniques. And I really love art. Artwork is beautiful. And for people to be able to create beautiful masterpieces that also entail efforts to help society, that's the best thing possible is whenever people make beautiful pieces of art through music or movies or visual art or anything of the sort that aims to uh, answer societal questions questions but creativity also is just creation in general so like creating buildings and architecture and things of that nature really creativity just kind of stretches all over the map which is what's so incredible about it so so with your book you're hoping that each individual finds their own creative way to deal with their issues or to deal with an issue in our society yeah that would be beautiful that would definitely be the goal for people to read the book to look at the artwork and to sort of take a step back, and it's not an incredibly dense book or anything by the means. It's, you can sort of go through it slowly, and uh, just very simple poetry that can sort of make you take a step back and think about where you stand and how you can implement these messages that I'm trying to place in my poetry into people's lives. And the artwork kind of acts as a uh, a different perspective for looking at something that we see every day. The artwork mostly features like pictures of paint. My thought behind that is that mixing paint is something that is an incredibly common uh, occurrence, but it's something we rarely step back and really just look at. So the photos are supposed to be a sort of representation of how if we just take a step back and look closer into the beautiful, intricate things that we're missing on a regular basis, we could actually live a much happier and more beautiful life because things like artwork and beauty, those are what we really live for as individuals. We strive to be financially stable and create societies that are financially stable. But once we've achieved that, what we really live for are things like science and art and creation, beautiful creation and discovery. So... It's kind of what I'm going for. All right, Christopher. Finally, Judith Dixon recently bought a home and was so moved by the experience. She wrote a book entitled A Successful and Proven Guide to the First-Time Homebuyer, Putting It All Together. It's a lot of title, Judith, but then again, buying a home isn't easy. And you're not even in real estate, right? No, I'm not. I'm not in real estate, but um, we purchased our first uh, condominium uh, about two years ago in November. And it just inspired me to write a book about it and help everybody else. Um, it's supposed to be a guide for the first-time home buyer. There's probably a bazillion books out there on how to buy first-time home buyers. You know, right? Right. There are, but mine I think is unique. It's a very easy read. Purchasing your first home. It's not elaborate. It's um, doesn't have any flamboyant language. It's it's a very very simple guide. I, I write for the reader. I don't write for myself, um, and it's it's very it's small. It's about thirty pages, but it's got uh, everything from soup to nuts, from hiring a real estate agent to hiring an attorney for the closing, and I think it's got an enormous amount of information in it. What is it that you thought people needed to know? I had wished I had written a book after we um, purchased our condominium because I uh, we could have done things a little differently, but we're very happy with what we bought. And um, a lot of books don't cover inspections. A lot of books don't cover, you know, real estate agents. And What do I need to know about my real estate agent? Uh, you have to really search out. A lot of these real estate agents are salespeople, and they just are interested in making the sale. Others are interested in taking the time 
and they're rare. And we were lucky because we were able to do that. We were able to find a real estate agent. She had 20 years in the business. And um, we took our time, but we worked fast because it's an open market and people are looking. And so we purchased our uh, condominium, first condominium, within about three months. And what about inspections? You really have to be careful because, I mean, we had an inspector and he went over the basic thing. But there's a lot of little things that we found out afterwards that we should have had checked. We were lucky because the kind of was in very, very good shape. There were no cracks in the walls. We didn't find too many. There weren't many damages at all, really. So you wanted to pass your good fortune on to other people. Other readers, exactly. What are you going to do now? I had a very good book signing at Barnes & Noble. Oh, good for you. Out here in Connecticut. And I have another one coming up at the end of a very large library in the city. Who set up your book signings? Um, I did Good for you. Do you know how many people are reluctant to do that? I know. It's, it's not easy. Well, what did you do? How did you do your book signing? I, I took all the store. I told them I just published a new book. And they have a lot of events going on, and they signed me up. Yeah. They love it. You're a local author. It, you know, what's better than that? Yes. See that? Never underestimate the power of being a first-time author if there's a bookstore you go into all the time, a coffee shop, a library. A lot of times they love having local people come in to talk about what they're up to, especially authors. I mean, go to a party, any party, go to a gathering. I guarantee you will find someone who wants to write a book. And just like the people who tune into the Page Publishing Book Club, they want to know what the process is. They want to know how you did it. They want to tell you their story, see if you like it. But you got to ask. Right? Am I right, Rob? Am I right? Yes. I am getting a head shake to the affirmative on that. Yes. And with that, we got to get out of here, Rob. See you next week for another edition of the PPBC. Same time, same place, 710 WOR. Have a great weekend. Mm-hmm.